So we call this workshop the Soul of Money Workshop, and you probably wonder, does money have a soul? Wait a minute. Um, well, we're not saying that money has a soul, but we're saying that you and I do, and that we can uh, give money a soul. We can imbue it with our commitment, with our courage, with who we are. As Sarah said, the, the word wealth, um, the etymology of the word wealth comes from well-being. That's what wealth really actually comes from, that word, in all languages, actually. And if you look underneath well-being, uh, I look at it as the well of being, the well of being, which is actually infinite in a human being. I'm looking out at Rod Stryker, the wonderful yoga teacher. I'm sure that when you're with him, the well of being is what you're tapping into as well as uh, really moving your body. Uh, and so our, our work with money, we work with families of great wealth. We work to help them not uh, you know, have their children be blindsided by privilege. Uh, we work with people who can't make ends meet. We train people um, in, uh, to fundraise with integrity and heart. Um, and uh, we really help people understand that the word philanthropy means love of humankind. It doesn't mean rich people giving money away. It means love of humankind. That's the etymology of that word. So everybody's a philanthropist. Um, and so the Soul of Money workshop that you're in today is a, uh, a two-hour, you know, kind of a, a, a deep dive, as deep as we can go, into your relationship with money. And um, our culture, not just in the United States, but it's now clearly a global culture, a money culture, that's filled with what Sarah referred to, and I'll repeat again, life sentences. Life sentences. Sentences, phrases, that become prisons in your mind. Like, you'll never make it. Or, you know, the, the things that sometimes a grandmother or a father or a boss has said to you that sticks in your mind and becomes a life sentence, almost like a prison, particularly around money. Um, the, money is the root of all evil is a phrase that's, you know, that's misinterpreted from one of the uh, phrases in the Bible. Uh, people actually get caught with life sentences. We all know that. So part of what today is about and what we think we have the time to do is to have you begin to uncover and free yourself and dislocate yourself, uh, disaggregate yourself from life sentences that come from stories, stories you told yourself about money or uh, stories you told yourself about the, the world of money. So we live in a consumer culture that's actually unfriendly to our humanity. It's put money above our humanity, above the value of human life, above the value of the natural world. We will destroy the natural world for money. Good people will do that. We will put huge numbers of people at the effect of a company or a business or a product for money. And people are lauded for it or celebrated for it. People make a killing rather than living. A killing meaning they hurt something somewhere or someone somewhere uh, make their fortune. Not everybody does this, of course, but we all know that that is part of the consumer culture in a way that um, uh, maybe millions in some cases of people are uh, exploited or marginalized in order for a fortune to be uh, amassed over here. Or uh, many, many millions of people on this planet, hundreds of millions of people, probably billions of people are making what we call a dying rather than a living. A dying meaning uh, doing something that demeans them, uh, something that has no self-expression, something that just brings home some bacon or tries to make ends meet. And really the more inequality that we have in our world, there's more and more people making a dying and fewer and fewer people uh, making a killing, those who are making the killing. And then very few of us in the middle making what we're calling a living, a living, which is doing something that gives us self-expression, makes a contribution, we know we're making a difference with our life and we're not doing it at someone's expense or at the expense of the environment or the natural world. So, um, you know, there's a lot more you could say about this and we will say more as we go along, but we're going to start really with you and your money story and um, Sarah's going to take you through 
uh, some exercises. This is a workshop where you're going to spend some time talking to each other. And I'll just say that the, um, the way to play here is uh, to go full out and to know that the perfect that this is one of the uh, final days or this is the final day of the conference where people really are already in love with each other. They feel safe. They uh, feel like, you know, you feel loved and held so that you can, you know, share some of the things that are, like Sarah did, some of the darkness in your relationship with money. I'll say one other thing. The money culture is, um, has a lot of suffering in it. And we say uh, at the heart of that suffering, are the lies the culture tells us about money. Buddha said the source of all suffering is a lie. And the source, we think, of the uh, suffering, immense suffering in our culture around money, it seems like it's maybe your fault or you're ashamed of something you did or didn't do in the divorce or the way you, you behaved after a business fell apart with your partner or those kinds of things, but um, we're going to suggest that you share all of that, where you've been hurt or where you've hurt someone else, but also that you realize that the money culture drives us to do things that are inconsistent with our humanity. So this workshop is a little bit about forgiving, forgiving yourself and forgiving other people who've been involved in things that you're, uh, that you're afraid you would never want to tell anyone or that you feel bad about. So that's kind of what we're going to get into now. Everybody game for that? Okay. So whatever it is that you did that you might be ashamed of or was done to you that you feel hurt by or the wounds and hurts that we have around our relationship with money is um, we assert, I assert, and you know this is a workshop so we can assert things up here, that it's the money culture that kind of forces behaviors that are in our it's turned us into uh, consumers. We used to be citizens. Just think about the word citizen. Citizen is he or she who's responsible for the well-being of the community. He or she who's responsible for the well-being of the state or the country or the world. That's a very noble title for a human being. Uh, but we've now devolved to consumers. We're called consumers market to us consumers, even our political leaders treat us as merely consumers. The definition of the word consumer is he or she who takes, diminishes, depletes, destroys. That's the label now for a human being. And that has real power. We don't realize how much power labels have on our psychology, on the way we perceive ourselves. So this, these wounds and hurts that may have been inflicted on you or you may have inflicted on someone else, I'm suggesting that the money culture is almost like a toxic fish tank in which we're swimming that makes us all a little bit sick, makes, it makes us want things we don't need, makes us make um, inappropriate sacrifices, makes us fight over uh, custody of children, uh, really when it's all about money, you know, things that are that we look back and we're like, God, why did I do that? Why was I like that? Um, or things that are done to us that hurt, that are inflicting uh, pain on us. And this is all part of what we call the condition of scarcity, which I'm going to talk about a little bit more after this next process. The condition, mindset, culture of scarcity that's driven by the money culture in which we all live. Um, and it makes us uh, less of who we are. Um, it diminishes us. And so I'm suggesting that um, you free yourself a little bit of feeling guilty or pointing the finger at someone else who hurt you uh, in this session. That's, you have an opportunity here uh, in this beautiful, beautiful place in, uh, here in Aspen to let stuff go. And there's just nothing quite as powerful as letting stuff go. We all know that. So the next part of our process is about forgiveness. Forgiveness. Now, um, uh, one of the great privileges of my life was working with Mother Teresa. And I knew her. She was a teacher for me. I was lucky enough to sit at her feet in India um, uh, uh, during the part of my life when I was working on ending world hunger. She was you know, a huge figure for me my whole life, like she is for most people. Uh, I never thought I would have the privilege of working with her, but I did. And Mother Teresa 
didn't talk a lot, she didn't say a lot of stuff, she just was. <laughs> you know, she just was a, 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 a living saint. Uh, but she did say that the most powerful form of love that there is, is forgiveness. It's the hardest form of love to express, and it's the most powerful form of love on earth.